And now we're starting with offtheball.com. Rugby forgot that it isn't football on the game's major worldwide issues. This is Royal Nugent. It's always interesting uh, to hear him talk about this from a broadcaster's perspective, but also from a media executive's perspective too. So that's on the papers yesterday and kind of follows on as well nicely from the stuff that we've been doing with Keith Wood's State of the Union. Great one last week with Andrew Mertens and Michael Checa. Uh, United players had to keep Beckham and Ferguson apart after flying boot and uh, the stitches, Maria, that uh, David Beckham needed. Uh, would England have walked off if they were losing? Sean Barnes talking about racism and the response, a really in-depth conversation that uh, John Barnes had with Joe Malloy yesterday and worth digging out for loads of different reasons. Like it's a full career retrospective, is an hour and 10 minutes and they spent about 20 minutes on the racism issue, but he's studying it a lot at the moment, talking about Liam Brady being his favorite player in terms of technique. And <clears throat> Colm O'Rourke also joining the opening or reopening of GAA pitches debate. We should be urging less caution at the moment. Um, certainly that's in keeping with uh, a lot of views, including in some in the papers today, which we'll get into in a moment. The Irish Independent this morning leads with the story that COVID testing is the start for League of Ireland clubs for European participants to have squads checked ahead of June 8th return to training. So these are Dundalk, Shamrock Rovers, Bowes and Derry City. They're going to undergo independent medical procedures by remaining in their cars in a drive through facility set up at each training ground. Initial results are due back by Wednesday. A photograph there of Tiger Woods playing at medalists last night and search for top stars of past 50 years gets underway with Leinster's finest revealed. Meanwhile, how Munster are drawing new blood from the GA heartlands, writes Rory O'Connor. Dick Clerken is writing about how kids need more than GEA pitches for a new normal. And Eamon Sweeney is writing about the Bundesliga. Fox in the box, Werner looks mad to keep Liverpool on top. The uh, Irish Times this morning, is that what I'm doing next? Sorry, checking my list here. Yeah, Irish Times. Um, so I'm going to do the Irish Examiner next. You know, come to the Times. The Examiner here is uh, O'Leary had huge respect for Galvin despite tussles. So this is uh, Noel O'Leary and Paul Galvin. That one. The picture there is from 2012. O'Halpine regrets casualties of filthy, callous, cold strikes. Sean O'Halpine uh, telling the Sunday game last night. Flaws in GA anti-doping education as substance taken unintentionally. Declan Rooney has been speaking with uh, Turlock O'Brien, who says there are flaws in the GA's anti-doping education program and former GA physio leading worldwide rehab of COVID patients. This is really interesting stuff here from um, Turlock O'Brien. I think the first time he's spoken of, about Ray Walker's positive test. Um, the anti-doping education is provided every year, but there are certainly flaws in the whole system. The GA need to look at it. There's no question about that. The players have to have the education completed by the 31st of March, but the National Football League is over at that stage. It doesn't make sense that you're testing players and you haven't had a chance to complete their training. Unfortunately, he failed his test and there is nothing we can do about it at this stage. Um, I think this is, makes sense that there should be some mechanism to ensure that players have been educated and then they become part of the system. At the same time, there shouldn't be an opportunity for somebody to be on a doping program and join an intercounty panel and like put off doing the education until, you know, so there needs to be some way to make sure that you can actually make sure that somebody isn't using and using the, oh, I haven't been tested yet or I haven't been trained yet as a means of um, getting out of it. So I don't know what that mechanism might be, but certainly you should probably pull the date back from the 31st of March for your finalising your education to October, November. And if anybody joins the panel after that, they have to do it in the first week of joining the panel. Some, some mechanism needs to be evolved there. And then obviously Sean O'Gahal being talking about strikes. Um, the aftermath was filthy, it was callous, it was cold, and he says he thinks about it every day. The London Times this morning goes with the story about the return to play in the Premier League. League drops plan for hotel quarantines. So the Premier League will not require players to be quarantined in a hotel for either one week or two before matches resume. So this was obviously done in Germany for the resumption of the Bundesliga. The results show that the infection rates currently in the Premier League are very low. There were only two positive results from the most recent 996 tests, taking the total to eight uh, from five clubs. Bournemouth confirming yesterday that one of their players was amongst the two latest positives. So Premier League clubs uh, don't feel it necessary to actually create this sort of bubble, don't actually feel that they need to put them into hotel quarantine before games. 
Uh, Tiger Woods, their photos again at the back of that newspaper. And Wenger's joy at Liverpool finally losing. Arsene Wenger has spoken of his pleasure at seeing Watford ruin Liverpool's chances of emulating his invincibles at Arsenal. It was a form of satisfaction, he says. We always like to be the only ones to achieve something. It was they who could only really go to the end, but it shows that it's difficult to repeat this feat. In any case, that day, I had a lot of messages from Arsenal supporters. The um, Irish Times this morning, um, Peter Markey Clerken's column. As the news gets better, can the pull of the field be resisted? And obviously they've got a picture of uh, Peyton Manning watching his partner Tiger Woods put yesterday. Damien Duff departs Celtic to focus on Ireland row with Kenny. That was confirmed yesterday <laughs> by Neil Lennon that um, Damien Duff is going to be full-time with Ireland. Halpin Ruse remarks during player strikes and um, George Cruz departs Saracens but retains hope of playing for England. I guess if he's only gone for a year and he's still quite young. The Panasonic Wild Knights. Uh, what what do you think their drinking culture is like, Owen? Actually, it's um, we spoke to somebody from the Panasonic Wild Knights uh, during the World Cup. They're, they've got a very actually interesting culture where half the people are actually Panasonic workers and then half the team are actual professionals. So does that create more of a chance for drinking? Maybe. Potentially. Maybe we, we only train in the evenings because uh, the lads are working. It's like, all right, let's go. I mean, when your name is Wild Knights, I know it's, you know, like... Uh, chivalric knight, but actually, you know, wild knights by name, wild knights by nature, surely. I hope so. It, it would be a shame to not get uh, the, the benefit out of your your trip to uh, to Japan playing for a while if you're not going to get a, a few good nights out of it, I'd, I'd assume, as a, as a rugby player. Uh, Malachi Clerkin's piece, as the news gets better, can the pull of the field be resisted? It's not a million miles away from the other conversations that have been had at the moment over the course of the weekend, making the case that as the numbers continue to go down, the, the key indicators of how well or otherwise we're doing uh, when it comes to flattening the curve, the date of the 20th of July looks increasingly untenable, it says. Uh, while clearly well-intentioned, it's going to look like taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut soon enough if everything keeps going in the right direction. What do you make of all this? Yeah, like that's two months away at this point. It does feel that it is still a bit of a leap to, to think that everybody will still be happy enough to go along with the GEA's return to play plans at that point. Like, you can see why they've come up with this date, why they've kicked things back, because caution is uh, a way of proceeding at the moment that you can't really criticise whatsoever. They've, I, I think what, what people could perhaps take issue with was the, the lack of consistency with the government's roadmap even and the, the GEA saying, well, we're not going to have any intercounty championships up until October, for example, which kind of suggested a uh, conservatism that was actually beyond how conservative the government wanted to be. And in and of itself, the government had been criticised for perhaps being a little bit too conservative with their roadmap as well. So it'll be interesting to see how patient people stay over the next couple of weeks. I think some of these arguments have been worded poorly. Like I, I think Colm O'Rourke is, is probably leaving himself open to a bit of criticism when he talks about the risk in, in the headline that we have up on offtheball.com this morning. But I think what Maliki is saying uh, is right at the moment. That's like you are driving around, you are seeing... Uh, I guess, small, socially distanced clusters developing in more open fields. And they're obviously the, the publicly owned uh, parks that you might see in Dublin, for example. But down the country, a lot of those parks that would be available to people will be GEA owned and people can't get into them. They're locked out at the moment. And you can see why that is as well, is because of the insurance issue. And if anything does happen on one of these pitches, there's going to be a huge insurance bills to, play, to pay. So you're in this kind of situation now where the GEA will need to make a deliberate move to bring forward the opening of these GEA grounds if anything is going to change. If the infection rates continue to nosedive, if the case numbers continue to nosedive, particularly in rural areas, you'd imagine the GEA will just have to say, well, this has worked out pretty well so far. Thankfully, let us change our dates. I don't think they're, I don't think they're acting out of any sort of, oh, well, we need to uh, keep people out for the time being. I think that they are still acting with the belief that we are in a worst case scenario or, or could have approached a worst case scenario. That has to change over the next little while. It's two weeks now since John Horan has spoken on this subject, over two weeks now. Like, have things changed a little bit over the last fortnight? I would have thought so. I would have thought the continuing nosediving of figures, nosediving is a bit strong, I'll accept. Uh, the, the, the decrease in figures uh, surely means that John Horan could come out again or the GEA could come out again and say, well, we are reevaluating this. A couple of things strike me from that. 
we had Luke O'Neill on, he was like, well, you know, you could have players playing in Kerry for other counties, depending on how the figures are going. And, you know, at the time, people were like, oh, that's too difficult to organise. Now everybody's like, well, sure, look, the Western Seaboard's totally fine. Mostly it's the big cities that are having the issues. Mostly it's uh, nursing homes. We've become a bit blasé about the fact that we're talking about um, an incredibly virulent virus that is killing people. A little bit. Just in the middle of all this, it's like, well, what if there's a cluster in a GAA club and uh, you end up having one of those people be one of the statistics, the one in a thousand people who didn't have an underlying health condition and who dies from this because we needed some championship action. Like, the whole, the other thing about the socially distancing, uh, socially distanced training, do you have faith that a match isn't going to break out? I mean, we actually weren't in the same um, park yesterday, I'm almost certain because uh, anyway, I'm almost certain we weren't. So you saw a match and I saw a match. And mm. I'd say loads of people saw matches. And it's very hard for a bunch of teenagers or it's very hard for anybody who's kicking around not to suddenly kind of, why don't we just play three on three or five on five and the game breaks out. And like, maybe that has, maybe, you know, maybe the science says there's actually, there's not enough contact in those matches and that's a safe thing to do. And this age group aren't, transmitting it to each other and actually it doesn't exist in this part of the community at the moment and it's fine. I don't know is the thing. I, like there's mm. just this, there's this surge of momentum. I'm not like he uses the word momentum at the end. Uh, the year might not be done. Momentum will push it along carried by its own weight. The year might not yet be done after all. Um, two weeks a long time from this and Spillane and O'Rourke where two weeks ago I was like, ah, oh, call the year, stick a pin in it, it's over, the year's finished. Not that much has actually changed. People are still dying of this thing. Still people in the ICUs. We still have the private hospitals on call just in case there's a second wave. Good chance it's going to be a second wave in uh, September, October. I don't know. I'm just interested in how the conversation is happening. I'd like, I, as I said, I think that... Colm O'Rourke leaves himself open to criticism by saying we should be urging less caution. Like that, that's the, the headline on, on that piece. That's not something we should, we should not be urging less caution. That is for sure. However, if we enter into an agreement with ourselves that we want to return to any semblance of normality, then we will have to enter into an arrangement where risk will be present. It is just about minimizing that risk. Like you mentioned, I, so it, it was Luke O'Neill you mentioned um, in, in terms of the potential for little pockets around rural Ireland to potentially spring back up and actually have little events, social distance training, perhaps in GA clubs before the rest of the country. Like you take Kerry, for example, like the average daily increase in cases in Kerry over the past five updates has now dropped to 0%. Like these are the sort of figures that you're approaching now where you're like, right, okay, is it. this risk weighted in our favor? Is it worth the risk of something trivial, which it is, something trivial as uh, GEA pitches reopening at this point? Maybe people will actually be able to make the, the case that uh, an average daily increase of 0% still poses risks, because of course it does. But conversely, you could also say, well, the, the chances uh, of... GA pitches opening and and changing that drastically, perhaps that might not also happen as well. Like I, I hear what you're saying, like and I 100% I disagree with the idea that we should be urging less caution. Caution should be the number one thing that we are preaching at the moment. But I would also believe that there is going to be an element of risk no matter what happens next. And maybe the right thing to do is nothing and and not reopen whatsoever and and keep things uh, tight and relatively locked down for the next few weeks and months at least. Uh, but then what is the figure that, that we get? What is the point where we are we are accepting that there is no risk? I'm not sure if that will actually occur this year. Yeah, I, I actually, you're right. There will never be a no risk situation, uh, probably until the vaccine and who knows when that's ever gonna happen. So let's move on. The star is uh, Screen Giants. Hammer's plan to beam fans' faces into stadium. So they've got a mock-up of a giant Zoom here of uh, celebrating West Ham fans that the players will run over to and celebrate in front of. I mean, look, any port in a storm, let's work these ideas through and maybe come up with a better one. Uh, and there's a picture of somebody in PPE at uh, Melwood disinfecting. I don't know what that actually is, but uh, it's some um, gear that they're using for 
the ground staff and then also League of Ireland stars to get tested to try and get the European teams back for that one as well. The Mirror this morning leads with Andrews Townsend. Don't cheat lockdown. Players must behave and not let teammates down now that we're moving closer to full contact in training. There's a flashback there to all the great European finals, Liverpool 1977 and 2005. You've also got that story about Arsene Wenger as well. My joy at cop blowing on beaten run and as well that West Ham story. Zoom with a view for Hammers fans. So that's essentially Arsene Wenger saying he was delighted. He's like the um, champagne swilling 1972 Dolphins every time that mm. uh, somebody gets beaten. And like, it's actually nice that he thinks that way. I think that there's a, that competitive urge still burns brightly within Arsene Wenger. And I would, it's like, it's great to see. Like Miami Dolphins is exactly what came to mind as well. He didn't exactly say he was popping champagne, but I would be disappointed if he wasn't. I'd be disappointed if he didn't have a few drinks that... Glass of dry Riesling. That's what he's drinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's like, I mean, that's that, that's mad to think that that was like actually one of the last sporting events we had. Actually, I was I was about to say, well, we, we've had kind of lots of water under the bridge uh, in a sporting sense ever since then. It's actually not. Was that like Liverpool's last Premier League game before lockdown happened? Second but, last, yeah. I think. Yeah, or second last. Know. Like, I mean, good, good on Arsene Wenger is what I say. All the Arsenal fans certainly got a huge kick out of that because they can't get a kick out of much else at the moment. And Arsene Wenger with. The Arsenal crest basically tattooed on his heart at the moment. It's not literally, but uh, it's in his heart somewhere. I think that's just the way, the way to react. We need to see more of this. Um, I'm just trying to find exactly when. Ah, no. So they, sorry, they played. The, the Atletico game was. Um, yeah, the last Premier League game is what I mean. Yeah, last Premier League game. No, they beat Bournemouth and um, Chelsea beat them in the Cup, Watford. So it was the 29th of February. Since then, they've only played one more. Uh, Premier League game and they've obviously been bundled out of the Cups. Uh, the Herald, back page. Player set for COVID-19 testing. This is the League of Ireland story. Bowes, Rowers, Dundalk and Derry begin return process and cleverly integrity of league at stake. So, Tom Cleverly says the Premier League's integrity could be affected if players worried about their health choose to miss matches. I mean, this is true, right? If some players decide they're not going to play and other players decide they are going to play, what do you do? Like, at the same time, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the correct scenario here is where you force people to go to work and they're terrified of bringing home a condition, especially if there's somebody in the house who might be um, immunocompromised or whatever. Like, and yet the league has to continue because the league has to continue. That's what has to happen. At some point, they're going to get to a point where um, maybe it's too soon. Maybe that's what's happening in, uh, in England given how badly the authorities there have handled the outbreak of coronavirus. Maybe if they were in an Irish scenario and they were seeing similar figures as we're seeing at the moment and the rate going down as quickly as it is, maybe you'd be like, well, you've got to just got to get out there and play. You've been tested and it's, uh, they're taking every precaution. I suppose until you're happy that that is the case, and um, I'd say we're still like three, four weeks away from the restart of the Premier League, then, I don't know, you can see what Cleverly's saying. I, I think you let them you let them have their free pass and not play if that's what they want. I think football clubs should be thankful that they can get back out onto the pitch and actually play football games. If they happen to be missing a couple of players, it's not ideal for a club down the bottom of the Premier League to be missing a top-class player, but you would trust that the player is coming to the club with legitimate concerns. I mean, it's in their interests, the player's interest, to be out on the pitch, to be out there playing, to be able to get a, a new contract, to be able to get a move, whatever it may be. They, there is no incentive for them to to kind of ham up any sort of danger they're in or to, to lie about anything. So it would be for their own safety, for their own concerns. And if there are genuine concerns, I think you give them a free pass. And there, as I say, the, the Premier League should just be thankful that they can perhaps proceed with 95, 98% of their players in tow. All right, next one. Um, from... It's the Irish Daily Mail yeah. uh, this morning. All systems go as the headline. Premier League restart gathers pace as officials back close contact training. Championship clubs will return today after two positive tests. Pep back at City in PPE. Meanwhile, project restart continues. And Sean Oakes says, I should have kept my mouth shut. Sean O'Gohal has been admitted last night that he regrets he did not keep his mouth shut during the bitter heave against his former manager, Gerald McCarthy. And then, uh, finally for me, for now, is the Irish News. Hamilton Celts play better under Lennon than Rogers. Hoops Foundation chief hails Lurgan Mann's impact. 
So that's uh, Celtic playing slightly better football under Neil Lennon than they did under their last manager, uh, also from the north. And um, yeah, so that Damien Duff gone full time, I suppose it was to be expected. But it's probably good news, right, that Damien Duff is concentrating 100% on the Ireland job. It can't, it can't be a bad thing, that's for sure. Like we, we had wondered if there would be a, a similar situation to Robbie Keane perhaps double jobbing for a while between club and country. And maybe it worked out really well for Robbie Keane. We, don't, we still don't really know what the, the inner workings of that was or what Robbie Keane's thinking is on everything. But I would certainly be of the opinion that if you can focus on one thing, solely then that is the way to go and it seems that Damien Duff is going to take it that way like it's it's really exciting that he is in the FAI camp at the moment and that we're going to hopefully see his coaching career blossom and this is going to be an important first step for him on that you got one more paper first at the Guardian this morning I don't have it on my phone here but I'm sure it'll appear on your screen in just a second I don't have a Guardian this morning either. So the Guardian is probably leading to do with something about project restart. Yeah. <laughs> we can guess. Uh, not to worry. We didn't need the Guardian anyway. Uh, I do have a Telegraph for you for the last one there, so I can give you that. And the Telegraph, this is actually interesting. Clubs call for clarity and protocols after positive tests. That's the Premier League story. But they also have a picture of Rafa Benitez, who apparently is keen to come back from China and go back to Newcastle. Benitez keen on Newcastle return under new owners. Not for him concerns about sport washing. And uh, England pair could be heading to St. James's Park. So he intends to build a mediocre team full of English players, John Stones and Ross Barkley, which I think would be a horrific waste of money for anybody <laughs> to uh, go and, you know, but actually maybe that's exactly what uh, Newcastle deserve. is a, a 10 year John Stones and Ross Barkley era, which starts right now, where he's like, oh, these guys, they're really good. They're going to be the centerpiece of the England team that eventually, you know, Ghost of 66, blah, blah, blah. And it's like just at the key moment, just when you think they're about to make a breakthrough, Ross Barkley misses an open goal and John Stone stands on the ball and Demba Ba nips in. <laughs> Who's going to be their Robinho is the question. I, I, like, Are Newcastle going to sign Erling Haaland? Look, if they sign Erling Haaland, he ain't no Robinho. He's Alan Shearer or Mark too. That would be that would be the perfect signing. Like, just go and spend two hundred and fifty million now. Like, if this is your plan, I know you'd find some difficulties making that work from financial fair play. But either that, or you you know, you banning us from European competition for three seasons. That's grand. When three seasons, we'll have uh, Erling Haaland in the team. But who is the Robinho now? Then is that uh, Vinicius Junior or something like that? I mean, I, at the time, everybody thought Robinho was going to be decent. Yeah, like. Playing for Real Madrid, that, that, that's where the, the comparison continues. He'd scored 25 goals in 101 games. Not the worst strike rate. And, uh, like, I mean, when he started off at Manchester City, like, he, he wasn't a bust straight away. The bust happened over a period of time. Rubinho's only 36, by the way. And uh, he's still playing with uh, in Istanbul. I did Is not he? know that. I thought, yeah. I thought he had some legal difficulties. 